Okay. Listen to this. Just focus. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot. You guys know what that's from? The Tempest, Prospero speech, moving on, listen. He's like on a mountaintop. He's about to break his staff. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back. You demi puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make, whereof the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the new tide sun called forth the mutinous winds and twixt the green sea and the azured vaults set roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder I have given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak by his own bolt. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers oped and set them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I hear abjure and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do to work mind end upon their senses, that's referring to his crazy brother and all those people, that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms into the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. So that is Shakespeare, you know, Prospero, giving up his staff, his power. And uh, a long time ago I did a puppet performance of The Tempest in a little swimming pool um, where I played Prospero and it was like he was on the island uh, after shipwreck and then he made the whole show from, um, and it was kind of losing his mind. So out of a trunk from the shipwreck he had, you know, a mirror, uh, Miranda died in the shipwreck so he had her doll and, uh, and in the mirror was like aerial reflection of the shelf, shadows kind of caliber. And it was very kind of, you know, low level uh, idiot psychology, but that's fine. What I loved about this speech uh, was the Jan Kott, he was a Polish theater critic and essayist, wrote about this, because it's not in the 50s or 60s, uh, about the metaphor for nuclear power and uh, our ability to control the environment uh, that's contained within this speech. You know, uh, graves at my command have waked their sleepers oped and set them forth, you know, these medical miracles that we've created and things like that. And so in thinking about doing this presentation, I just wanted to begin with that speech because it's uh, you know, written a long time before all the things we're going through right now. And I thought it would be uh, interesting to just start thinking about that. Now, just to give you guys a background. So I'm a, some of you may have seen A Billion Nights on Earth or other things, but I basically make theater shows uh, from scratch, direct, design them. Sometimes I'm in them. And... When looking at this show, I'm going to start in the back and then we'll get to this thing. So this should work. Mike just handed me this and this weird thing. So I feel like I'm on a YouTube thing. Didn't work. There we go. Great. So I, I started to think about previous works of mine and how they dealt with the environment. So this is, I'll just do a quick recap so we can get to the big one. So this is, it was a piece called Flamingo Winnebago. And this was a piece that I wanted to do about peak oil, which didn't really happen, which was good. Um, it could happen, but basically I was really uh, taken by that idea. This was, in, you know, 12 years ago, that, you know, we'd run out of oil, and then none of our planes would work, none of our cars would work. We wouldn't have any oil, you know, so forget the environment damage. We wouldn't have a way to run anything. So to develop the piece, we basically came up with this guy, uh, by, played by my friend Mooney, and his character was named Mr. Ajit, and he worked in a gas station in New Jersey. Uh, and it was a Sinclair gas station, so there's a little logo there. We had a huge sign, yeah, in the corner uh, of a dinosaur. So took the metaphor of the dinosaur, you know, taking its uh, bones and dead carcass and spewing it back into the air through the use of uh, gasoline. So he decided to give that up. He buys a Winnebago across the street um, and fits it out to run on fire, fr uh, fire grease. And so this set just turns, and the back of that set is the front of a Winnebago. And he ends up going on a journey to Las Vegas, and he goes to the Salton Sea, where I, uh, 
I went with this guy named Lars Jan, who's a really good video dude, <laughs> and we actually did some research on the Salton Sea, which is a kind of great apocalyptic landscape with shopping carts half embedded in the sand and you know uh, broken um, playgrounds. Very, very scary, very weird place. So that was like an early piece specifically about kind of that kind of environmental destruction and peak oil, but all told through this kind of fun uh, road trip journey. And then I did a piece in 2011 called The Melting Bridge, and that was about uh, a father and son, and the father was working with these indigenous tribes uh, up near Alaska, at Sarah Palin's Alaska. I know a lot of you probably really like her. She could see Russia from over there, and so uh, this was a researcher who was living up there, and then he was going down to the Amazon, and his son was selling toilet paper, uh, and which is because we were reading in the research, the toilet paper is like the worst thing ever for destroying the rainforest because they grow eucalyptus, which dries out all the, the land and messes up all the other trees. And so, in fact, going, see, oh, wow, I just made a new connection. In Flamingo Winnebago, there's a Bulgarian guy on the road trip that meets Mr. G, who's like, kind of rips apart the way the culture is in the United States. He's like, what I do, I go, you know, uh, down the street to buy a Charmin, you know, with the, all my oil and gas, I go to buy a Charmin, the toilet to squeeze my ass, you know, the, why, why, you know? So he's just like kind of basically saying, you know, why would I even drive down a car to do that, get the toilet paper to destroy the rainforest kind of thing? Uh, so anyway, this is that kind of uh, piece, uh, you know, kind of messed up, depressing piece, but again, told with a very visual style. And then we did another one called Capsule 33, in 2011, where we were trying to uh, come up with the active solutions during the presentation of work. So this piece actually was run off power from the audience. So we found these South African power generators that the audience could pump uh, and generate electricity on 12 volt to plug in to run the lights inside of that little capsule. So we had to do the whole show within that capsule uh, and capture as much light as we could, and uh, the critic of the New York Times was like, the New York Times said, the lighting is very dim. <laughs> yeah, that's the world we live in. So anyway, and that, that this was a, a guy was in the capsule, the Nagaken capsule tower in Tokyo, which was this recyclable building. The idea was on a core, you would put these pod apartments and bolt them on, and then you know, every 10 or 15, 20 years, you would just take the pod off and put on a new one which they never did, so it's still the original pods from the 70s, and they're kind of all run down and mucky, but the idea was really, really cool. So this guy was a, a Serbian refugee from the war, living in the capsule uh, on the eve of its destruction, and he didn't want to leave, so he was gonna go down with the building. And his best friend was that duck. Uh, so, that leads us to this show. I've been directing uh, for other theaters a lot, and. Uh, this theater in Spain presented a work I directed in Sweden based on a graphic novel. And the artistic director sat next to me and said, hey, do you want to work with us and direct something? I said, I would love to. So I, I followed up with them and I met with them. And uh, this was in October. And they said, great, you should direct something for us. And I was like, what? And I was like, no, no, you make it up. And I was like, no, 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 you, you give me a script. You give me, a, I, I don't want to create anymore. I don't want to, no, 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 you, you invent a new piece based on the idea of what is the future we're going to leave our children. Um, and I have a son, he's uh, six, and uh, Raphael. And so basically, you know, they presented me with this ridiculous challenge of how to make a piece, you know, for our kids, for the future. And uh, so I don't even know... Uh, where the title came, I think one of them mentioned a meeting because in Spanish it's Anthropoceno, because this will be in, in Madrid, the Anthropocene. Um, and basically, the concept is to make a show about the current situation that we're in, that we're all aware of on different levels. But um, basically, uh, here I'll give you a little bit of the uh, Wikipedia definition, just very shortly of the Anthropocene. So it's a proposed epoch dating from the commencement of significant human impact on Earth's geology and ecosystems, including but not limited to anthropogenic climate change. So basically the idea that it's an epoch of time where geology and the forces of nature aren't changing the Earth, but we are. 
So anthro being us changing the current environment that we're in. Uh, and that is a very huge, ridiculously large, and very scary topic to try to take on to develop a theater piece. Um, so let's see what's next here on this. Great, that's kind of it. So look at this, creation begins. Today, June 9th, 2019. Um, because I'm standing here talking to you guys about this. So that is basically the first step in the creative process of uh, when you're uh, trying to make stuff from nothing, usually the best way to do it is uh, give yourself, at least for me, deadlines and goals and things. You say, okay, if I have to do this talk, then I'll have to prepare a first, of a thing that doesn't exist, a first series of uh, ideas and concepts to kind of pitch, uh, uh, to get my head together. Because if you see this, it says development rehearsals, June 20th, which must be soon, because the 9th is today. So basically, the theater in Spain has given me uh, eight actors. In a way, what we're talking about now is how these kinds of pieces that Chad and this festival and other festivals bring kind of start their genesis. Um, so they want me to do a show with four actors, but they want me to rehearse with eight because they want to hire eight for the workshop process. And then I guess I have to fire four, which I really don't want to do. Um, so I told them that, you know, um, but they, I can only use four in the end. And we'll do um, two weeks of development workshops based on the ideas we'll go over now. And after this, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. And then we'll come back and we'll rehearse in December, January, and then there'll be the world premiere of Anthropoceno. In Spanish, I speak a little Spanish, so that will help me direct them. Um, or it w will not help, but we'll see. Um, so, let me... That was the Shakespeare part. Yes, so, the Anthropocene as a human epoch is like not a confirmed, agreed upon, um, you know, indicator of time. It's still being debated, and uh, because it's very controversial in the way that, uh, you know, I mean, but also you have to think about, we made up everything anyway, or, you know, we made up language. I'm just saying words in different, I'm using my mouth in a strange way to say words that you're understanding because you use your mouth in the same way. So... You know, everything is very abstract in this world we live in. So this is a kind of just beautiful spiral I grabbed off a place called the World Wide Internet. Um, just to kind of show you this kind of, you know, evolution of time, and it's these different, you know, there's the Mississippian period and all these different periods. And the idea is now we're driving into this uh, proposed Anthropocene, which is the period where we're creating uh, the new geological period that we live in. Uh, and what, the, what I love about this concept is that a lot of people are proposing it started with the Trinity explosions, uh, where going back to Prospero and Shakespeare, that is the, uh, the power, and that Jan Kott brings up, the Polish uh, critic about Shakespeare, that uh, we are able to control the winds and the climate and everything um, you know, by doing that which is, you know, pretty interesting. So that's the kind of premiere first image of uh, the show, and uh, which takes me back to the Flamingo Winnebago idea of my, uh, part of that show was about trying to find out about my grandfather, because my mother had a, uh, was a result of a one night stand between a Jewish watch seller from Detroit, who was with the mafia, and a chorus vaudeville dancer who was in the, uh, group of women tap dancing with little uh, Donald O'Connor. And he used to nail my grandma's shoes to the side of the stage. So when she would run and get in her tap shoes and she would try to get back on stage, she would, you know, collapse on the floor. So she never really liked singing in the rain, old Donald O'Connor, my grandma. But anyway, my grandfather, who I never met, later moved to Vegas and became the kind of host of the Flamingo Hotel and uh, the uh, greeter, as it were. And so, uh, in all this research, we found pictures of him with Queen Elizabeth and the Beatles, and we found out that he was the one who led these tourist groups to go into the desert and watch nuclear tests uh, 
you know, the Flamingo Hotel would be like, you know, tomorrow night, let's go, you know, and they'd all get in uh, cars and go in the desert and wear those, like, kind of 3D glasses and watch, you know, nuclear test explosions. Um, so I've always wanted to, like, theatrical deal with, you know, a bunch of people in Las Vegas leaving the Flamingo Hotel, going to see, you know, nuclear explosions. That's always a fun thing. So this is kind of a, these poor Spanish people are going to be uh, thrust into Las Vegas. They love Las Vegas. Um, and nuclear explosions uh, to just start to try to grab some images uh, to try to develop a piece on uh, two levels. One is the kind of graphic imagistic level, and the second level is to try to find characters for them to play that would connect to audiences of like small personal things uh, related to all the situations we're going through, which I'll get to. This is all very well organized, you guys. Don't worry. This is... Um, We're kind of going with the flow here. Aha. Now, here we go. Wait, I just wanted to grab this. Yes. Okay. So. This is, you know, a really nice painting of the natural world, a nice little bear and the eagle, tiger, and just getting ground up by these, like, bad, you know, capitalist, corporate, greedy people and turning it into money. Now, that's a very didactic image, but it, for me personally, that's essentially what's going on and what's been going on for a very long time. From my, I was in Miami last night, so my flight this morning, I was really thirsty. I bought a $3 Dansai water. I'm drinking it thinking, you know, this is not even spring water. There's plastic in it. So, they've done, you know, so I'm like, I'm paying $3 to drink this plastic to fill my body. And then, so I started to feel nauseous. You know, because the Danzai guy is one of these guys, you know, grinding up the natural world. And so the kind of underpinning sentiment of this show, and I, I think a lot of us are feeling, is this absolutely massive, overwhelming situation of the way we're living and using things all the time every day and not really doing anything drastic to change it. You know, it, now we're not using straws, which you may have noticed, they're all mostly paper. I don't know how that is up here, but in Miami, everyone's using paper straws. So the anti-straw campaign worked. So if we can get rid of straws, I'm thinking, why can't we get rid of a lot more stuff? And we seem not to be able to. So that kind of philosophical debate between our intelligence and our brilliance and our absolute stupidity is the kind of back and forth that I want to kind of Yin yang play with uh, during this Anthropocentric show because it really doesn't make any sense. You know, how can we, you know, make a little phone that does that, but in the end it just hones in all our energy, sucks it away while everything's, you know, supposedly falling apart around us, which, you know, when you have a six or seven year old right now, you get really worried about those things, or at least I do. Uh, so it's basically uh, how to theatrically confront all those ideas um, in a theatrical work. Now, another thing that this is gonna be based on is, we will not get into this because it's too scary, the uninhabitable earth, life after warming, the David Wallace Wells book, he wrote an article as well. This is so horrific, we're not even gonna talk about it, I'll put it over here. Uh, there's a funner way to talk about it, which is an author named William T. Volman. Does anyone know him? He's, uh, yeah, he, I, he's my favorite author. He's completely out of his mind. He writes thousands and thousands of pages of books, and uh, he's got this deal with the editors that they basically, um, they don't have to edit the books down. So they're way too long, way too much information. But he always starts to dive into these really neat, interesting details. So he wrote uh, two books called The Carbon Ideologies, volume one and volume two. Um, one of his first quotes in this book is, nothing can be done to save the world as we know it, therefore nothing need to be done. <laughs> Pretty awful. And then he you know, brings up certain really interesting points. A homeless person in America uses twice as much energy as the average global citizen. 61% of the energy generated in the United States, this is a few years ago in 2012, accomplished no useful work whatsoever. Um, and you know, from 1980 to 2011, 
global energy use uh, nearly tripled. And then, of course, in 19, 2015, oil prices dropped. And so every Time magazine was like, great, now big cars are back. Right? So it was the exact opposite reaction. Uh, it was a whole acceleration um, of that. So uh, basically, uh, there's a kind of humor and a wit to the whole thing, uh, which leads us to the road. The McCormick, uh, what's his first name? Uh, Cormac McCarthy book, which uh, has that really amazing scene. You know, it's the father and son trying to go through an apocalyptic world, uh, which was filmed in Pennsylvania. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, and there's this crazy moment when they actually get to another person who has a shopping cart, and they recognize him. And it's very subtle in the book, but you get the impression that these guys walking through the apocalypse, the father and son, run into the former president. And the father says, don't I know you? And the guy kind of shies away and kind of runs off. And I, I don't know how he did that because they don't say anything more than that. But it clearly was the president of the United States who, you know, probably wasn't a very good one. And I don't know if you guys have noticed politically what's happening. I've ignored it. But someone told me that um, who's the president of this country. I don't know if I could say that. I don't even, this isn't being recorded. Good. Um, uh, is... Uh, when you look at the things in the, in the 70s and 80s when the, all these environmentalists were realizing what was happening and how much careful, you know, how we had to really start to do something, and then nothing was done, and then every opportunity, something that maybe could have been done, you know, Al Gore, um, I believe, won the election. Um, he might have helped better than George W., where they just went to, let's, you know, increase the oil usage two billion fold and create a war against, um, you know, the entire, hey guys, you guys want to fill them in, um, the, the entire Arab world. And then the current from all going all the way up today to, I think it was yesterday, the current president basically ignored a report. Uh, yeah, he basically was like, no, 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 I don't jive with that kind of report about what's going on with the environment, so it's actually not happening. Uh, so... That, that's only on a surface level, because then there's the idea that um, Greta Thunberg, I don't speak Swedish, but, you know, the, the student from Sweden who's been protesting uh, every Friday and done all these amazing movements is, you know, why the hell aren't we really doing anything? You know, little recycling here and there, none of that's going to do anything. And so, again, that goes back to the philosophical question of why aren't we really doing anything to just live less wastefully, you know? Um, so, that leads to, all right, I'm going to talk you through the exact creation process we'll be leading these actors through. Where's my clicker? Of the slides. All right. So, this is uh, I love these images of all the flight patterns at night across the Earth. And if the Earth were to spin, you would see that, you know, the flights go, you know, the entire Earth is almost completely covered except for the whole, you know, Siberian and Far Eastern part of Russia and certain parts of, of the jungles of South America and the deserts. But it's just an incredible um, image to me of our impact on this, er you know, orb that we're on. So the set design, let's see, for this, this is just a rough way I sketch, is going to be a, uh, a geodesic dome, kind of inspired from Buckmeister Fuller, but really just to be a half earth um, on stage that'll be uh, painted black. It won't be that exact shape, it'll probably have these panels on it. And so what we're doing, it's called the toy, the game, the playground. Because in developing new work, we're basically gonna build this thing. Uh, they're building it now in Spain for us. They'll put it in the rehearsal room We'll give them these very scary ideas, uh, these really scary books that I've refused to read. You know, I'll just make them do it. <laughs> um, and uh, begin a series of improvisations uh, where they'll be searching for characters. And some random ideas are, you know, it could be an oil worker in an oil field in uh, Saudi Arabia. 
uh, a librarian who's ignored uh, her phone and all internet because she's completely overwhelmed about, you know, you know those, if any of you has the Facebook, you know those, those articles that come in in every five minutes, like 2050 is the cutoff date, we will all be dead by then, if we don't do something in the next 10 years, you know, that stuff is just like, and, and they're, they're so good at like psychologically just completely tearing you down to a melted piece of, you know, butter on the floor thinking about, you know, your kid when he's going to be 50, you know, with the shopping cart. And then he, you know, finds that one last soda can that he opens to taste the bubbles just before his head gets chopped off by cannibalistic, you know, Pennsylvanian um, <laughs> gangs. Um, and uh, there's also this idea to play with technology in the show, which is a little bit like Ready Player One, but uh, if, you know, people are diving more into these fake realities with those, those weird, I don't even know what those are called, I'm so old, those weird glasses that they put on. What are those called, Lars, those weird? Yeah, exactly, I don't even know what that is. The New York Times gives them to you and you put them on your phone with a piece of cardboard and stuff. I'm almost 50, so that's like for, I don't even know what that is. But anyway, I thought it'd be really great to stage a whole dance sequence with the actors playing a whole VR game uh, with those glasses, but we never show the audience what they're actually seeing. But through their movements, you know, you might be able to get, you know, a whole kind of uh, sequence and, and basically play with the natural and the unnatural. Um, but again, the whole thing has to gear up towards some kind of... Uh, diving into the, the gravity of the situation if the world is going to get that hot, if the seas are going to rise, if all the coral reefs are going to collapse, if all the fish are going to die, if all these messages that come in every five minutes on Facebook are actually true, some of which seem to be very true. Another great idea could be a nice little love story between a grocer in a little cafe in Madrid selling organic uh, food who meets uh, you know, a guy or a woman or whoever, it doesn't matter, uh, so they are then, you know, getting into the dilemma of thinking about having children and what that means and what's the responsibility of that or the, you know, because the idea of the future is, at least that I'm struggling with, is what is that now? You know, when you was growing up in the 70s or 80s, I never thought, you know, I was like, oh, 2000, I'll be 26 years old. That'll be so cool. But then you don't, now I'm like, okay, my son will be in 2050, he'll be that old. You know what I mean? It starts to get a little bit, Scary if these things that pop up every five minutes on Facebook are remotely true. And then there's this idea of, of course, the, the characters of the children, like Greta, who are basically putting everything down and saying, why do I need to you know, stop racism or uh, recycle when everything's falling or go to school or learn math when if we don't fix the situation, I can't study math. I couldn't even be a racist if I wanted to be because there'll be no environment to be a racist in. Um, which is weird for these uh, Trump people because they'd be like, well, we're not going to be able to be like that with no environment. It's kind of weird. Then the next thing we'll bring into the rehearsal room besides some of those loose ideas in this kind of dome is certain myths. We'll take that Shakespeare quote uh, from Prospero, the Prometheus myth, uh, the text of Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, and the time-lapse structure of Cloud Atlas, the David Mitchell book, where they're in the future, they're in the past, and, and you kind of start a whole different kind of theatrical style. I've been very interested in um, just three days ago, that's why it's not even in here, is Alexander von Humboldt and all his research in South America, uh, codifying plants and animal species and all these things. Um, and then there's a really good United Nations report on climate change from last year, uh, that maybe we put in a character who's a Spanish uh, diplomat dealing with uh, the UN and maybe dealing with the United States, which, because we have weird representatives. So that could be funny. They're a little less weird down there or over there in Spain than we are right now. Um, and then what happens is, is these elements, the poems, these ideas of characters in this dome, all get kind of thrown into a blender and we go into a series of improvisations where the actors will go in groups of one or two or four and start to develop little scenes and then improvise them with this dome, 
which means that you can relieve yourself as a creator and a director and make the actors do it. And if you do your job well, you don't actually have to create or direct anything. They'll do the whole thing. And in the past 10 years of, of my privilege of being able to work and tour many places, the most successful things I think I've done have been the workshops with uh, students and community actors and other uh, directors from different cities we're in and just get a, a game going where they make their own work based on this kind of open improvisational style uh, because it's something that they're connected to, they can deal with the material, it has a humor to it, and then they're interpreting their use of the set and transformative design in their way without preconceived notions from me. It's kind of an organically created work. And then, All right, let's see what's next here. Okay, so these are just some rough ideas I had about the dome could be uh, projected on from the top to actually, you know, do the Trinity explosion in video on top of the dome or that map of the flight patterns. If you had an air traffic controller, they could pop out through a little window in the dome, and then the map is actually 3D around them. Um, it's really just, uh, again, another resource and tool uh, you know, like a window at the top of the polar ice cap. You could literally melt. You know, I just made this up now. You could put some fabric on top of the dome and then pull it through. Oh, melting ice. You know, well, it's so cool. You know, uh, you could open it up and have little micro scenes inside um, the actual dome. And I think what we'll do is we'll make it black and the entire stage black. So uh, it, it will look like nothing's there, which is a very kind of cosmic, you know, Big Bang situation where the stage is empty and clear and from nothing becomes everything and then it goes back to nothing again. Um, and then this idea could be a observation, uh, a conservatory, you know, an observatory, excuse me, looking out into the stars. Uh, it's just different kind of like possibilities of the, the design. Now, that still doesn't help me or my team try to understand how to deal with, hang on one second, everyone just relax, the gravity of the situation. Here we go. I wanted to say, okay, so, the, uh, this is the uh, pitch text that we gave the theater. And uh, what was really interesting is this has been kind of the, uh, the most uh, you know, epic and vague idea that I've ever had. Uh, and they put it on me. They said, make up something you know, for the future of our children, you know, something for them to think about, which was really great from William T. Bowman because he said, you know, he wrote uh, his books about uh, the collapse of the environment as a, um, something for someone in the future to read 100 years from now so they can understand how we got there. There's another book I had that was basically uh, written from the perspective 100 years from now and has a very dark perspective that, you know, the seas did rise, a lot of uh, forest turns to deserts, and it's really trying to... Uh, historically understand, even though it hasn't historically yet happened, how we didn't stop it and how we just let it slide right through our hands. And I think of it was a general apathy from the overwhelmingness of the entire situation. Um, but that's for me why Greta is so inspiring and uh, this idea that if people could actually really stop most of the things they're doing, to really uh, transform somehow almost all their activities into a way to um, collectively work towards a solution to the climate crisis. And Robert Downey Jr., I don't know if you guys heard this just two days ago, was in Las Vegas at the Mars, Jeff Bezos' Mars conference. Um, 
and he got together with a group of people, and you know, he's just a big, rich movie star, but he's a clever guy, and, and he was like, all right, I want to fix it now. I want to do it in 10 years. I want to clean up the oceans. I want to clean up that big plastic thing of, uh, you know, island of uh, uh, continent of plastic trash floating in the ocean, the vortex thing. And uh, so we're going to do it in 10 years. I'm going to launch a website next month called the Footprint Foundation. So we do have Robert Downey Jr. dropping everything and trying to really, like, go with a, a hardcore active solution. Um, but that still doesn't... Uh, help in terms of how to try to get um, a theater piece to propel these ideas forward without becoming a didactic horror show. Um, and so that is what we're really looking forward to diving into, is basically taking a group of these actors, giving them very scary ideas, very hopeful ideas, and essentially a way to present something on stage that probably is very horrific, that probably does look at characters in the future, that probably does propose something very scary. Because at this point, if um, it's better to be aware and scared and try to save any kind of you know, snowball effect that's going downhill, as opposed to not. Because A, when you drink the Dansai water in your plane, from Spirit Airlines for $3 that's filled with plastic that you can physically taste as it's going down your stomach, you're like, wait a minute, I should never ever do that again. Ever drink uh, you know, water from a bottle of plastic ever again. What are the uh, you know, things that are happening around me in, in an awareness of like not using, wasting you know, energy and resources? And that in terms of going from the atomic explosion in 1945 of how we capture energy and is able to you know, start to blow things up, create things um, to make our lives more easy, um, now have probably threatened our lives. When I was on tour in Manchester, uh, I had a great conversation at a bar with a guy from there, and he explained all these beautiful canals that they have in Manchester. And it was just fascinating because he said, you know, it was really cold. I'm not going to try to do their accent, but he's like, it, it was so cold in the 1840s, 1850s, so cold up here that we wanted sweaters and we wanted to get them sewn very quickly. So we invented the Industrial Revolution to get sweaters sewn more quickly so we could warm up, right? And so this guy at this bar was basically telling me the entire Industrial Revolution was based on how cold and like damp and, you know, annoying it was in Manchester, and then those factories got going, and then they started to, you know, uh, bleed over into London and to Liverpool and then into the United States and all over. And they were making these huge factories, which in the uh, late 1800s, uh, we went through a period where people were freaking out because the cities were so filled with smog and soot and horse manure. Um, they were much more dirty than they are today, in quotes, in a microcosmic way. Um, that then eventually they were cleaned up. The same thing it, which happened in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s. You know, I went to school at Whittier for a year in the early 90s, and there was a black cloud of smoke over the entire city of Los Angeles. And then they just changed the laws on the admissions, and now it's much cleaner there than it was. Um, so there's these like hints of these environmental collapses that then we can recreate. Um, and those hints, in looking at my past work, were all there. In the Melting Bridge, for example, um, we studied a lot the Mayan culture, which did collapse. And basically what happened is they just built too big of an empire, if that word sounds familiar to anyone. And, um, and they had too much people to feed. And basically they ran out of resources and ground to grow the corn and wheat. And the power structure was too strong that the entire civilization essentially collapsed. Um, but that was just on a tiny little piece of the Mayan Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, not the potential situation we're looking at now, is the way I see it, is the entire Earth is now that Mayan empire and that Mayan society that's on the verge of uh, potential total collapse. Um, so it's really, um, it's really hard to sleep at night. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about any of this, but it's really crazy. Um, to, um, you know, I feel like the situation before were these like little minor problems, you know, the certain government would drive you crazy, but now it's kind of an overwhelming, uh, 
Do you guys feel that weight, or is that just me? Yeah. There's like a weight that's more, and then, especially if you have a, a little one, you know? I would be a little more, so if, you know, if I didn't have a little kid, I'd be like, this is bad, but you know, I'm okay, but you know. And, and one thing that we do is, is my wife and I try to have as much fun and, and do as many cool things as we can, because you know, it's not over now. Um, and he just loves nature, so we're like, if we can just keep, you know, encouraging his love of nature and the beauty of nature and the exploration of nature, then he'll be fine up in, I've been looking at you know, northern Siberia and stuff, there's nobody there. Um, and it will probably get a little bit warmer there. Uh, we did a show in Moscow, and I was like, what, the, what is there from Moscow all the way to the Far East? There's really nothing there. So you know, that's a good place to think about um, for all of us. Besides, because the rich, what they've done is built these bunkers in New Zealand. Jeff Bezos and all those guys, they have these like underground bunker things. But I'm, I'm sure the prime minister in New Zealand will kick them out soon. She's pretty cool. Um, what does this counter mean? I don't understand it. Mike, what does this counter mean? Uh, it's going backwards. It's going the wrong way. How long do you have left? Got it. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. I was like, well, it's really scary. Yeah. I know. See? Isn't that amazing? But I'm really thirsty. I mean, this also would be a very interesting resource um, coming out of the dome. You know, you put a flashlight under this, you get a nice little kind of lamp effect kind of thing. So I think one thing we'll probably do is go to certain recycling bins in Madrid and have the actors bring in, you know, uh, materials, because we can literally, like, puppet literal the earth. Um, but the biggest challenge will be how to develop a thing where it's not, like I said, this didactic mess um, where people are like, yeah, we know that's the situation. Um, and that's what happens in these kind of developmental processes. The same in Billion Nights on Earth that we did last year. Here was uh, the actors improvise things that are fairly terrible at times, or ideas I have that are fairly terrible, and then we just like don't ever show you those. We weed through those and try to find the essence of those ideas that uh, poetically, you know, express the ideas. But what I'm afraid of in the develop of this Anthropoceno is that it might become along the lines of William T. Volman, which is, you know, since we can't do anything, there's nothing to be done. This kind of, you know, very uh, meditative, poetic, beautiful meditation on the situation that we find ourselves in. And what are the waves we could ride or what are the ways we could try to flip it and maybe get away from being so zoned into a kind of hypnotic state of inaction to at least giving uh, one last fight uh, or one last attempt um, because... You know, this relates to certain philosophical theories I've had. That we live most of the time in Bogota, Colombia, or in the outskirts with our son. And when I hear about the school shootings here, my son and I have friends who have kids go to school. I'm like, I would not put my kid in school five minutes in that country. My country. I would be, no, you, why? I, I went to school for uh, six to 12 years. I remember five or six days were remotely interesting. So, you know, in public school, I don't know if you guys, you know, I can, I can name five days on my hand that were great over 12 years. So I'm like, I could teach my son those five days straight across and then, you know, but if he were shot in a school, but I would never forgive myself. So then it made me think, wait a minute, what is the whole society that we've created? Is it even real? And then there's the concept, and this brings up to the last point, and then we can wrap up, is Yuval Noah Harari's books, you know, he has a couple. Uh, this is the Homo Deus one. What's the other one called? Yeah, exactly. So that one's so incredible because the way he breaks down language and the fact it's like America, America. If you say America, for example, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. It's a weird map maker who was called Amerigo. And then we're running around saying this continent land. It's, it's like the uh, land acknowledgement. Like, wh what is America? You know, uh, if you want to go further back, when they named it, they just pronounced a bunch of vowels. The, the native people who are living in there who came from the Bering Strait probably, who originally came from Africa, you know. So it's like what I love so much about 
the way he thinks in these books, is the way we've constructed our reality, interpreted it through language and classifications. And that's what I mean. How important is the United States public or private school system as an educational system um, to also allow your kid to go in there and maybe get shot? You know what I mean? I would not let my kid in school in this country. <laughs> like, you're not going. Um, uh, and be like, but that's against the law. I was like, I don't care. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to send him to school. What, what, you know, they gave me five days. You know, so I don't know if I'm an anarchist or a nihilist or what. But um, I guess what is interesting as a bedrock to the show, and then we'll wrap up, is with the Anthropoceno idea is to not only, you know, look at the situation we find ourselves in as these, like, uh, you know, beings evolved from the sea, I'm not that religious. Um, and you guys can cut that out, but uh, I'm so paranoid with the cameras and all this, uh, is that in a way, you know, are we now like insects on a little tree that have now overgrown, you know, the entire thing that then, you know, the earth takes care of itself and gets rid of us, and maybe that's okay. You know, maybe that's just, uh, how it has to be, but the idea is to look at that, that's why it's a half orb, uh, to think about this surface of this planet we are that's in space that also happens to just exist based on gravity and propulsion, which the moon gave us the tides, you know, it's this kind of whole metaphysical exploration into, you know, our ex existential reality, um, and, you know, grappling with our own brilliance and our own you know, stupidity to be able to create these things of such beauty and scientific, um, unbelievable, you know, clarity and detail. Our, the way we've understood at least our version of the universe is really just mind-boggling versus the fact that we can't, you know, we have so many bad habits that we can't stop those habits and consciously say, well, we have to stop all of those habits in order to survive. So what we'll do is just kind of let the ball roll and let it just become what it's going to become. So that's kind of the ultimate goal of the show, and that's why um, it's uh, kind of, you know, I'm not here giving you a book I wrote because if you remember where we're at, and that's why I'm very interested in this reception, which I didn't know about, Chad, so this is very exciting. After this, we will be in some garden somewhere in New Haven, and we can talk more about it, because the reason why that's so important for me as an artist dealing with this kind of thing is it says June 2nd, June 9th, excuse me, creation begins June 9th, 2019, which is today with you guys and me just kind of throwing this uh, you know, proposal we got some costumes being knitted right here. Um, and uh, I think some people will have some interesting thoughts in the garden. So um, basically what I would want to invite all of you guys to do is join us in this place Chad is set up. I don't know what it is or where it is. Um, I came straight here from the airport. Um, but Chad will let you know, right? You know where it is. Yeah, good. Yeah. So. For me, that's where I think we should head, and I want to hear, you know, I would love to talk to anyone who would be willing to talk to me about what seems interesting, challenging, or any kind of details about trying to do this kind of thing on stage now and opening in 2020. Now, wait, 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 almost. We just have to hear that Shakespeare one last time with all of those things in mind. From the Tempest, Prospo realizing he's done everything he's wanted to do to gather his revenge, and then he's alone in the forest, and he, sell, he says, ye yells of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot to chase the ebbing Neptune, and to fly him when he comes back. You demi-puppets that by moonshine to the green sour ringlets make 
whereof the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, called forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azured vault set roaring war. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers up and let them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I hear abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work my end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms into the earth. And deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Mike, that's the blackout. Mike, black. Yeah. 